announce your names. First, our moderator, Dr. Chetan Yagiri, the editor of Interstellar.news. Professor uh, Chetan Yagiri is an internationally renowned and award-winning space scientist specializing in astrochemistry. With a wealth of experience working on interplanetary space missions in Europe, Japan, and the United States, Professor Giri brings a deep understanding of the technical aspects of space exploration. His expertise extends to space policy analysis, emerging techno geostrategy and ethics, space economy, and science tech diplomacy. As editor of Interstellar.news, Professor Giri provides valuable insights into the Indian space industry, startups, and the global space landscape. His extensive research, consulting work, and academic affiliations make him a key, co key contributor to the platform's coverage of the space domain. Dr. Giri, thank you very much for agreeing to moderate this session. May I please call upon uh, Mr. J.D. Patil from Lassen and Tubro? Mr. J.D. Patil served on the board of LNT as whole time director, defense, and smart technologies. He is currently member of the Executive Council of Management of LNT and advisor to the CEO and MD for LNT's defense and new age smart technology businesses. He has a rich, more than four decade long career in Lassen and Tubro and has been instrumental in growing the nascent technology and product development group of LNT's corporate R&D. He spearheaded LNT's foray in the defense sector since the inception of the segment in LNT and in the mid 80s itself. He oversaw the evolution of LNT space businesses as the longest and most mature industry partner of ISRO. Mr. Patel, thank you very much for agreeing to be a part of this session. Welcome to this panel. Our next speaker is uh, Air Vice Marshal D.V. Court, retired, former Chief of Defense Space Agency. In his 35 years of distinguished service, AVM Court has tenanted a variety of operational staff and instructional appointments. Before retiring on the 23rd of July, he commanded the Defense Space Agency for two years. He is a Category A qualified flying uh, instructor. He instructed the U.S. Air Force from 1995 to 97, uh, and at the Fighter Training Wing, uh, Hakimpet. He also served as senior instructor at the Defense Services Staff College, Wellington, and as head of the Faculty of War Gaming at the College of Air Warfare, Sikandrabad. Thank you very much for agreeing to be a part of this panel. I would like to call upon Toby Simon next from uh, Synergia Foundation. Synergia is a strategic think tank and incubation company that works in the area of deep tech and advanced technologies. Toby Simon is a commissioner with the Global Commission for Internet Governance and a member of the Trilateral Commission. He has been an advisor to several international organizations such as the World Health Organization, Medicine Sans Frontier. He's currently pursuing his doctoral studies in strategic security. Mr. Simon, thank you very much for agreeing to be a part of this panel. Colonel V.S. Valen, the founder of Elena Geosystems, I would like to call upon next. Lieutenant Colonel V.S. Valen is an Army veteran. He dedicated himself for the proliferation of satellite-based navigation using an Indian constellation called Navik. He has been associated with this technology since 1998 and with Navik from its genesis in 2008 to 2010. Since 2010, he has been working in this niche segment while in service, Colonel Valen was instrumental in establishing and developing the Ministry of Defense Integrated Space Cell, which has now grown in uh, the Space Forces of India. With his domain knowledge and expertise on GNSS, Colonel Valen launched Elena Geosystems in 2012 in the technology business incubator of IIT Kharagpur. He is the only company working dedicatedly to develop indigenous solutions for Navik. Colonel Valen, thank you very much for agreeing to be a part of this panel. Mr. Rohan Verma next, our next panelist, the CEO of Map My India. Mr. Verma holds a profound interest in technology with a focus on its potential for social good, along with a passion for maps, location services, IoT, automotive, mobility, electric vehicles, health, and sustainability. As the CEO of Map My India, he's primarily responsible for steering the company's corporate strategy and growth, overseeing sales and marketing efforts, driving product development and innovation. In 2004, he embarked on his entrepreneurial journey when he became involved in his family's mapping and technology businesses in India. He played a pivotal role in steering the company towards a consumer-focused approach, resulting in the birth of Map My India. Rohan, thank you very much for agreeing to be a part of this panel. Can I have a round of applause for this session, please?
I hand over the session to the moderator, Dr. Chaitanya Giri. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to moderate, moderate this esteemed gathering of doers, thinkers, academicians, as well as people who have delivered to the country when the country needed the most. So it's a, indeed an honor to chair or moderate this first knowledge session on utilization of emerging technologies in the civil and military domain. Emerging technologies are always a challenge because they run miles ahead, ahead of regulation. We rarely tend to understand its true nature, its true applications, and they always keep us on tenter hooks. And to discuss some of these technologies today, we have an eminent panel. Technologies ranging from geospatial to artificial intelligence to machine learning. To machine learning, to mapping. There's so many things uh, that need to be put into context when it comes to their real world application, especially applications in the battlefield. And the changing scenarios of battlefields ensure that we are on our toes and some of these emerging technologies are not only analyzed academically but also deployed in a way that the country does not suffer from surprises, strategic surprises. To begin this session, I'd first like to invite Dr. J.D. Patil, sir. Sir has been steering LNT and its defense arm for many years. We have been looking up to his views, his analysis uh, quite regularly at different intervals. The vantage point that he sits on, uh, from there, he teaches us a lot. So I'd first invite Dr. J.D. Patil, sir. Good morning, fellow panelists, ladies and gentlemen. When I start looking at uh, this annual conclave, this is, I believe, the ninth, Dilanjana? Eighth, huh? Eighth. Somehow I counted one more. Uh, right from the first conclave, uh, we realized the potential of what Nitin is trying to do. And from that point on, uh, we make it a point that uh, we are present here every year. And truly, I think this is the first year Nitin has got the word right when he, when he mentions there the catalyst. Something that doesn't get consumed only enhances the efficiency of what happens. I think that's exactly the role which uh, Nitin has, and his team in Bharat Shakti have been playing to make sure that every segment of the stakeholder in the defense ecosystem is actually present for this event. And this sort of uh, discussions, an enormous amount of takeaways, and there's a follow-up which Bharat Shakti thereafter continues to be doing. Coming specific to the space that uh, we are talking about as part of uh, this session and the emerging technologies in space, it's a bit of, a, I would say, uh, uh, cliche that uh, space is a very matured sector in uh, India, having truly built very sizably and completely indigenous ecosystem. In that sense, very, very complete Atmanirbhar exception being some small amount of imports. But for that, this is a sector which has been completely uh, on its own. And all credit to uh, ISRO 
that it has actually been realized since the point in time ISRO was founded in 1968 and today it's that exactly about a uh, little more than 55 years over which we see that this kind of achievements of ISRO have happened. Now, what has changed? Dr. Somna talked about it. What has changed is somewhere around 2020, um, I must say the COVID is a blessing in many, many aspects that truly provided time to truly think and get into some amount of forward thinking. And that's one of those things that happened to the space sector. This is a period in which after a lot of mulling, debate, discussions, the Prime Minister announced the opening of this sector for industry. And the reason to open it for industry, which is first aspect of the business model innovation. The innovation in the business model here is it was reserved for the state. ISRO was doing what all it can, but at the same time, the commerce aspect of what we do for the rest of the world was 2% of the global economy. At $6 billion is what India was producing for space. And that's from a point where there's today a target during the Amrut Kal, first 10 years of it from 2023 to 2033, it's expected to be of the order of 33 to $35 billion, a growth of minimum five to six times X from where we stand today. Now, this is where the business innovation is the first innovation that becomes extremely important. The second set of innovation, which we obviously need to go through, is ISRO focused on certain levels of technologies. And Dr. Somnath again very rightly talked about it. Geospatial, or let's say geostationary, has been an aspect which is well matured. Leo's, we done some more for uh, military satellites, but we haven't really done much. And this is an area where enormous amount of leverage, and that's where the new technologies are room for that. And that's essentially where one is going to be talking of very large constellations of Leos. One, for communication, we know the scenario in the border situations of our own country, the communication network is far more wanted, to say the least. Now, these are areas where having a fixed kind of networks and availability of uh, kind of uh, network on demand is not going to be existing. And the best possible solution for that, as well as lots of remote areas, is going to be based on what we will do from space. Now, the second aspect of the same thing is navigation. And that's where uh, Rohan will actually deal with a lot. He's one of those uh, people who essentially created for navigating something in our crowded cities, but also Navigation was one of those first requirement and what we all old timers working for ISRO know is the first commitment ISRO made to the fishermen who gave ISRO the first integration bay inside that church in Tumba. Uh, to them the commitment was as soon as we are maturing we'll provide a support to you and from space you are able to see which is a region in which they're likely to be fetching more fish, which is the place to go and irrespective of whether network is there or not, a communication message is passed on. These are the possible locations where their livelihood they can enhance. Now, this is an aspect of seeing from space with multispectral imagery to be able to see different aspects of what exists on Earth, below Earth, below the surface, as well as on surface. On surface, we necessarily call it the geospatial, but below is another aspect of this. And these are where the technologies have to far more start getting contribution, making contributions for the common man. The third segment and a completely different segment again is how to do, all of us know that uh, agriculture in, in India many, many years back used to be completely dependent on the rain god. Now, whatever the quantum of water that our rivers carry and flow out into the sea, if whatever extent we are able to store it and save it, how do you distribute it far more efficiently to be able to 
truly provide that extra livelihood to the farmer. And this is essentially where the precision agriculture is actually taking shape. There are many, many progressive states in which uh, I'm personally aware, as Lassen Dubro, we also do some of those programs of a lack of hectares being irrigated with a precision. Now, what is the precision associated with it is you can utilize multiple types of sensors of temperature, humidity, wind, the surface uh, moisture, and a whole lot of it is combination of technologies of sensory on surface as well as from the sky, and be able to provide very precise information to the, a farmer in terms of what is the right time to irrigate. So minimum possible water gets consumed for a highest possible yield. So to say, per capita water consumption, what is that you would get? And these are technologies wherein enormous amount of futuristic work has to happen because each type of crop, and we know that being a country of a size, we actually have a variety of crops and India became completely self-independent in terms of grain. But we all know in our own living life, we have seen that India was on the verge of the entire uh, food grains were sort of uh, not going to be lasting more than a couple of weeks. And that's the time the PL 480, whole lot of us who were young those days would remember the times when US decided to help India with the export of grain so that people can survive. These were years, multiple years when the monsoons failed. So in those kind of situations, how to survive, how to live, how to take it forward is where truly one can use technologies. The yet another aspect of the space technologies, which essentially will make enormous amount of difference for us to sort of fight, essentially now relates to the military segment. And that makes an enormous amount of difference for specifically this conference, because space imagery, Earth observation, call it different levels of analysis one can do to an extent of finding tunnels in our border areas, Every of these things are possible to be today done from space and enormous amount of work that truly is required to be done to be able to do that. If it's today up to a certain level of depth, it's possible to know little deeper in excess of 10 meters, it's not so easy. And this is, these are areas where huge amount of uh, futuristic energies that are needed to be done and towards this, when it was decided mid-2020 that the sector would be open, the first most important part is making a slogan to say it's open for the private sector is fine, but how do you actually make that happen? And this is an era where we found a regulator being created. Never in the world anywhere one would find that the regulator also has a job of a promoter and that's in space. It's a promoter, handholder for the new players who are coming in, making sure every government-owned facility which today was part of ISRO being made available at a concession. And I know, having been serving on the uh, in-space board, I know the enough amount of concessional rates at which it is provided to every startup, every industry who wants to do things in India. And based on that, from the upstream, from a rocket to a satellite, down to when we start getting the data down, after the downloading of or downlinking of the data, the data related handling is, all of us believe, is 80% of what one can produce in terms of technologies for all the kind of things that I mentioned earlier, to be able to analyze, to be able to say what needs to be done. And this is an hope this nation today carries it's just about less than three years young in terms of making the announcement of opening. First policy Dr. Somna talked about came only this April, but I must say 11 pages of that policy makes it so clear. And this is a beautiful piece of uh, work which has uh, been done. Uh, dozens of interactions with the industry, with every possible think tank and Based on that, on the flip side, we have the defense policy, which is 700 pages, and we still grapple every day with what is to be done. There's an 11-page document which precisely lays down 
role of every organization, what ISRO will do, what ENSIL will do, what INSPACE will do, what the non-governmental enterprises, that's a specific word coined. They don't say private, they don't say public, they don't try to create boundaries and wells within this sector which is called industry. They say anybody who is non-government. So whether it's the state and central government is the government aspect, the non-government, what is that will be done to handhold this, handhold, uh, this uh, non-government sector. And this is the non-government sector which truly not only will contribute in the upstream and the midstream of that 20%, but the downstream of 80. The biggest hope there is as the IT capital of the world and the IT and the ITES that all of us pride ourselves that India is being the capital of the whole world. This is precisely where that 80% of the commerce will actually get created. And people like uh, Rohan who is sitting right next to me uh, are the ones who are hope for future. And that's essentially where hundreds of those kind of startups are the ones which will make all the difference. I can tell you that six years back, seven years back, there were less than five startups in space. And this is an era where space was not even allowed to be open. Today, the last count we had is 160. In last three years, that's a kind of a jump. Now, the, in, the kind of solutions and kind of uh, uh, futuristic uh, approaches to technology that you keep hearing from each one of them is hard to believe. But what ISRO always did was imagery, typically, maximum amount of frequency that which you will do the mapping used to be limited. We haven't gone beyond four or five. A startup in India today says hyperspectral 180 frequencies. Now you decide a notch filter on each of those frequencies, put different gains and you get different outcome of the same image. And that's the power of innovation. And that's essentially what we are looking forward towards that building the commerce for the whole world. Now it's not just about technologies, emerging technologies, leveraging technologies, building actual solutions, taking to the world, gaining that kind of a competence that we are going to be someone very significant. The immediate short term 10 year target is to reach double digit in the space commerce. And that I would believe in terms of what one would want to achieve, not just talking of technologies and emerging scenarios, but from there to be able to take India as a logo right across the world to be able to contribute not just to Indian public, but to the global population and to help in that sense the mankind at large. I would stop here. Thank you. Jai Hind. For the panelists, we have amongst us uh, a crowd that is primarily from the defense sector. They are the end users of a lot of emerging technologies. Uh, they are also likely the handholders of the R&D of some of these technologies. And the role becomes extremely important uh, when it comes to co-development of certain emerging areas uh, that we will be discussing about. So uh, we have amongst us people who are into navigations, into mapping, LNT is into everything uh, under the sun. Uh, we have an end user amongst us, a former end user amongst us who brings you know, great insights uh, being the Director General of Defense Space Agency. So uh, I'll start with the first round of questions, five minutes each, and uh, then we'll come back again for uh, another round of questions, uh, and then we open up, up to the audiences. So uh, I'd first start with uh, Air Vice Marshal Khot. Sir, please brief us about uh, some of the emerging technologies that you, you've come across. Space is not an emerging technology. But how do you integrate AI? How do you integrate machine learning or some of the emergent materials into your needs? Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Chaitanyagiri. Uh, first of all, a very good morning to this very distinguished audience, luminaries from so many diverse fields, uh, the chair and my co-panelists, very good morning to everybody and uh, my thanks to Nitin Gokhale and team Bharat Shakti for this opportunity. 
coming to the question itself, uh, I spent about two years as Director General of the Defense Space Agency, a new raising. Uh, at the time, I was the second Defense uh, Space Agency chief. And it was an immersive two-year experience which forced me to look at a lot of opportunities, a lot of hard facts and realities, and gain uh, some insights. And I'd like to sh share some of those perspectives with you today. Uh, space is obviously uh, a, a child of technology for us. That is exploration of space. As much as is the Air Force, which is my parent service, and to a large extent the Navy as well, it is technology that allows us to move into these domains. And so we live off technology. The newer technologies make things easier, cheaper, and more accessible. And what we are undergoing right now, and it's, as the topic says, it's about new and emerging technologies for civil and military use. We're seeing a revolution in space affairs, so to say, to use, you know, or to take off from the term a revolution in military affairs that everybody in uniform would be aware of. What we're undergoing is a revolution in space affairs. And that comes from two main factors. One is the commercialization of space, the availability of space products and space services on a retail basis to the common man. And that practically opens up all of humanity as a potential customer to what comes from space. And that's a change, because space was primarily driven by military purpose and by government funds in its initial part, the first 50 odd years. The second revolution is actually a technological revolution, and which is different from earlier ones in the sense that this revolution comes from a fusion of a number of disparate technologies which is bringing different disciplines together to give you solutions which have not existed before. And the exciting future of space comes from this. To come to technologies themselves, I mean, they were, there's just a host of them that we can talk about. I will just touch upon a few of them. It all starts with the launch story. So launch vehicle technology is at the heart of how you are able to access space at all. Chairman Isro talked about the reduction in launch costs, and that's a very relevant thing. So new fuels, new materials, composites, lowered cost of launching per kilogram into space. And what's driving this particular thing is the small satellite revolution. And that's a fusion, that's an integration of a huge number of different technologies from materials to miniaturization, processing techniques, smaller sensors and payloads, smaller communications technology, all of it coming together into the small satellite solution. And so you have a transition that's going from satellites that were typically you know, 1.5 to 5 tons of the earlier generation and coming down to nanos and micros. Between these two, is the, is the story that's unfolding in front of us. Then I would like to point out after launch and the spacecraft technology itself, there is the mission operations technology because the life of the satellite is controlled by operations that take place and are controlled from the ground. So the ground segment, telemetry, tracking, payload commanding, satellite control and navigation, all of these are also areas in which there are very exciting things taking place. And then comes the downstream part. Once you've downloaded what you're getting from space, what do you do with that data? And that really is the pot of gold. And there, India's strength in IT is they are really looking to be leveraged into producing solutions in the applications area. And from the same set of data, you can produce thousands of applications, potentially. So a lot of, a lot of uh, thought needs to go into these areas. A lot of them are low-hanging fruits, and it's possible for us to really make a lot of headway if we concentrate on some of these areas here. In addition to that, the future is going to come down to proximity operations, rendezvous and proximity operations, as they are called, when you can close in to another spacecraft in space. Robotics, which is going to allow us to do a lot of on-orbit 
uh, activities like on-orbit servicing, on-orbit refueling, and so on and so forth. And all of this is going to be very, very important, not only for us, not only for the military, not only for you know, India, but for all of the global space order, for long-term sustainability of space itself, because we are proliferating objects in space at a rate which may make our continued operations in space difficult. And for long-term sustainability, we're going to have to do such things as active debris removal, technologies related to self-destructing materials, reusable launch vehicles, and of course the RPOs and the robotics that I talked about are going to allow us to keep space free enough to be able to utilize it in the future. So that's the primary basket of technologies at which we look at you know, with, with great interest. And I think a lot of the future is going to unfold from these. There's much more, of course, but I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. From space, we'll come to something that is more permeating, and that is navigation. And when it comes to navigation, we have Alina Geosystems. We have uh, Mr. Valen with us. Sir, could you uh, brief us about the increasing uh, tactical necessities of navigation in modern warfare? And uh, you, of course, navigation has numerous civilian applications. How do you balance it out? How, how does the market dynamics work? Uh, let me uh, tell you about uh, this technology per se, then come and answer your question of how do we balance it out between uh, the public and the defense uh, requirements. Uh, let me uh, introduce this technology to you all. See, th there is a technology which is a real catalyst in all your working. That is GNSS technology. What we all generally talk about as GPS is a global navigation satellite system based monitoring of your operations. If you use it, what will be the advantage that you gain? You will reduce your losses by up to 50%, increase the efficiency by 30%, virtually doubling the output for the same set of resources that you have with you now. That's the beauty of this technology. For this technology to be used effectively in our country or in our neighborhood, we need to have a system that will give us high accuracy, high availability, reliability, and integrity for us. A system that will stand by us when we need it. Such a system has been put up by India. We call it as NAVIC. You heard uh, uh, DG Isro talking about it today. He also insisted on having equipment, ground equipment, for using that. So that's where the uh, specification comes about. So this is an exponent. That's a real, what is the uh, real uh, display of Jay Jawan, Jay Kisan, and Jay Vigwan part of it. We have a technology. We have a science that's been given to us long time back by the Americans in terms of GPS. But we have improved on that. We brought about a new technology for, for our systems so that it could be useful in our area of geography. See, this is a geographical thing context. Most of us confuse it with electronics and IT, whereas navigation is a geographical thing, which we are in this geography. What is it required for us to use? Though our system looks like a what is a local system or a regional system as of today, government has got plans to take it around the world. So it makes a difference when we compare this with other systems is accuracy. Accuracy means other systems give you with a lot of additional satellites and a lot of towers on ground, they'll give you up to 10 meters, 20 meters, whereas our system will give you one meter without any of this because it's created for us. And that's where the advantage comes, both for the public and for the defense. The public, uh, if you say, many of us are confused with what is this one meter accuracy, do we need it? One meter means I'm sitting here, this is what it is. When we navigate using this, uh, we are all used to Google Maps. When you are using Google Maps, will it be correct? See, there is a bus stand called, uh, just beside this thing, there's a bus stand, Akashwani bus stand. You take that and try to locate in Google Maps and the current systems are there, very difficult. He'll put you through different, different routes. Ultimately, the taxi driver will take you through another route. 
similarly, there is a place within uh, our cantonment, what you call the terrier roster. Try locating it, you will never reach it. Then from uh, Maipalpur, you try to go to T3. It will initially show you a short distance of a couple of kilometers, then suddenly show you some 10 kilometers roundabout. These are all things. That's where a system which will support, because this all this is made up of a system which is made, not for our country. So we need to have a system which will help us in our country. Like that's where we have uh, Map My India here, who's getting you the ground uh, map data. On that, we will put a dot which will take you accurately to different positions. So that's what it is. Now about using it in defense and in civil part of it, the, ne the need and the utility is same for defense and same for public also. For example, defense needs uh, uh, drones which have to fly shortest distance in the straight path. Now we will help, help them. Same is required for a farmer for spraying in this what is the field. And more so in our context, the fields are very small. You need to turn the uh, what is the, the drone, the spraying drone in a very small parts. You are not going to go for a couple of kilometers spraying it. So that's a context. So in my sense. This technology can be used effectively by both defense and public. The utilization is the same by both people. Only the, where it is used, it has to integrate in different platforms. In case of defense, it will be a war fighting machine. In case of public, it will be something useful for the public, like a vehicle tracking system or a drone, or something like that. That's what is my context. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So, Greater accuracy of navigation systems is useful not only for civilian activities like farming, but it will also help you on the battlefield when you are meandering across forest, you are meandering across, uh, you know, urban jungle, uh, so on and so forth. Now, speaking about imminent imagery intelligence, we have uh, Rohan Verma with us. Uh, Rohan, uh, tell us more about your great experiences with Map My India. And uh, are we only restricting to mapping India or we are moving global? Uh, thank you for having me and thanks for the question and thanks Patil sir for being a mentor to us through the, all these years. Um, uh, <coughs> to answer your question first, Map My India is now also known as Maples. And uh, the reason we are doing that is because really we are now expanding beyond India. Um, uh, it, so in the last few weeks, for example, I was using Maple's app. Uh, it's a pre-production version. It's not in public yet in Korea. I had a colleague who was using it in Japan, Singapore, Malaysia, and then again, I used it in the Middle East. Um, and so two points I want to make today. One is how India will map itself uh, for its defense needs and security needs. And then what we as Indians, can offer to the world what we call the map my nation stack so that other countries in the rest of the world can also become Atmanirbhar when it comes to their nation's defense and security needs uh, uh, around leveraging the power of maps, IoT, Navig based IoT, navigation systems, drone based systems, AI and analytics, uh, geospatial and GIS and satellite based imagery analytics. What, what I call the MINDAGS stack, M-I-N-D-A-G-S. Um, so, I mean, uh, let me start with the Map My India uh, piece of it. Uh, you know, historically, since 28 years, we have created India's most comprehensive, accurate, and detailed digital maps. So that whether it's any village or any city, down to the house address level, and not just in 2D, but now increasingly in 3D, in high definition, in 360 degree, and with real-time updates, what we are calling 4D. We are building this digital map twin of the real world. I mean, just as an aside, fun use case of this is the cricket metaverse that we have just put out for the World Cup, where different stadiums you can experience in full 3D. And so as a consumer, you know where the bathroom is, where the stand is, what the view is from your seat, can you see line of sight beyond a particular area? But the true defense and security use case around this is around war gaming, around planning. Uh, you know, in case of a offensive or counter-offensive, in case of a kind of an operation. And so we really hope people use this real-world metaverse that we have built for 
all sorts of scenarios in the in the defense um beyond this maps i know historically people are have been used to using google maps but we all know what happened in russia and ukraine uh, war where google maps was turned off for the by for usage by uh, by by russians and uh, uh, what happens if that gets turned off for india it happened during kargil where the gps system was switched off so we can't really have a reliability on a system controlled by one country for our daily and i mean almost kind of a utility need around maps and navigation and that's maples india's own answer to that and in that we are really grateful to isro to partnering with us to exchange bhuvan and map india api so that there's one stack that along with navic one end to end stack where india is atmanirbhar when it comes to maps and navigation and the question people used to ask is you know everybody uses google maps so the answer to that is now in the last few months a lot of people are using maples app as well we have 10 million plus downloads uh, and you know it's increasing a lot i'm very grateful to the indian army for now taking this up seriously in terms of leveraging the maples platform in a completely secure non internet hosted manner from the maps to the software for navigation and tracking needs of various defense personnel or in terms of kind of leveraging or doing tot with map india for what is called indi gis indi uh, in, in, indigenized geospatial system around 3d and defense so lots of things happening in india and the last thing i'll tell you in g20 which happened we are quite grateful on one side the government used it for traffic planning uh, traffic management telling consumers using maples app where to go where not to go during the and how to go during g20 but at the same time using our iot navic based iot devices and route planning for all the vip cavalcade movement all the heads of state so that in real time in the control room they knew where the vips were the logistics planning of moving 40 heads of state from 30 hotels to the venue where the prime minister was going to uh, wait for them so that one minute by one minute without anybody having to wait they could do this so such a complex logistical exercise using indigenous technology all of this is happening in india india is no longer behind it is ahead of many countries and that's why we say it's really the india stack map my india stack that indian defense can use and similarly the way upi has been given to other countries to enable them uh similarly the map my nation stack can be given to all our friendly countries so that they too from maps to applications to devices and to drones and then satellites they can leverage the indian capability so that's what we are doing thank you ron toby simon with us toby is india's foremost think tanker who looks at emerging technology from a bangalorean vantage point toby uh we've seen some inroads being made when it comes to quantum computing sycamore zhuhang uh, what's the state of the art in india and globally when it comes to deployment of these technologies yeah thank you very much uh, giri and i want i want to also thank uh, nitin and the organizers uh, for doing such a fascinating uh, conclave uh, let me first put a, a context as to why i am here i i am the odd man out the outlier but over the last 25 years uh, we have been working in deep security in many parts of the world we we look at conflicts uh, we have been in conflicts ourselves in in different forms and we we do something that we call pattern recognition so from about 1991 we have been looking at it and what we do now for many years is we have been partners to the ministry of defense for about 8 years both at their aero india and def expo on what we call what's the future of conflicts so we put up the first thought leadership uh, in both these events and and we are humbled that uh, at least on three events in aero india and def expo our thought leadership was what they used as the theme for the title of the conference so we did one last in uh, at the def uh, the def expo in ahmedabad where we showcased uh, how conflict had changed in the last 10 months preceding that 10 examples all the presentations were done by people who had real battle experience and this was picked up by more by the americans 
the Pacific Command, and they invited us to come and do three or four round tables for them at the U.S. Pacific Command in Hawaii. We have since done a few workshops in India on a topic called quantum warfare. What we do is, given our background in understanding security, we try to bridge the gap between people who build technology and people who have to use. Because the semantics that both of them use, the trust that is needed to build this business, is something that we feel is a missing link. And that's what we try to bridge. We understand security. So when we speak to security practitioners around the world, there is a trust. And they know that we are talking something that we have been through somewhere in, uh, as a part of an aggregation that we do. So today I'll just speak about uh, the quantum thing and let me give you a context. The importance of quantum is that it is the next gen for us of cyber. And we will just agree on three things in cyber, that there are no air gaps in cybersecurity. Number two, the surface area of cybersecurity has uh, increased significantly with the adoption of IoT, which means every critical infrastructure that you have in civil or military has huge components of this, which means the vulnerability is more. And third, hackers have now started a new strategy. Hack now and decrypt later. And this is where quantum comes. If you see the attack on whether it's the Ames hospital here or any other critical infrastructure, people are hacking now and when they have quantum, they will decrypt it in less than an hour. So that's the game. The challenge is we don't know when quantum has come or has it, is it already there? We knew when there was Y2K because there was a day, it was January 1st, 2000, but we don't know when is Y2Q. So this is the biggest challenge, they're in quantum. And what, what, if I have to speak about the challenges, it is that most of our algorithms on which we have built all our cyber protection is either RSA or EEC. And that is easily compromisable under a quantum computer or even a quantum simulated computer. What we are now talking about is what do we do? I mean, we can talk about problems. What we are talking is about quantum encryptions and the future that, and why is it is so important. So as an organization, we mentor, incubate these sort of technologies and we look at two technologies. One, quantum encryptions beyond the world of quantum computing which either it's today or yesterday or tomorrow. And the second is artificial intelligence. How do you provide defense in AI? Because the moment you use AI, you, you have actually opened your, another front of yours. So somebody who can come into your system by deception can manipulate it and make sure it works against you. So these are the two areas I feel is going to be the next frontier of Security, whether it is military, satellite, space, just look at the combination of AI and HAPS, which will be your aerial uh, uh, data center for you to fight any modern warfare using robots, whatever. Just imagine that is compromised. You will shoot yourself. So I, I will just conclude with this that uh, from a practitioner's perspective, these are two most vulnerable areas, and I'm so happy that... Uh, when we are talking to the heads of the Army, the Navy, and the Air Force, uh, in India, uh, there is definite recognition of this, and there's a hunger to know more and more, which we find uh, something that will help us not only protect, but in times if we want to go offensive, it is possible. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Toby. Uh, before we close the session, I'd like to go once again in a round, asking a very generic question. And that generic question is, to each of you, which is the technology that you think will play a crucial role in the next uh, dual-use applications? Uh, you know, has it arrived? Or is it yet to arrive? Is it just on the anvil? So I'll start with Patil sir first. Hey. 
the most crucial technology going forward is once you move every of your uh, ability to see and sense into the sky what happens on ground what to be just about talked about on cyber you don't have to take the trouble of putting a satellite you just hack somebody else's and use it for yourself or confuse and put all kind of wrong data and wrong information so this is a technology wherein beyond what in the known realms what we are dealing with an unknown which is essentially going to be extremely important the systems which today go into space will have to have that kind of intelligence built in and to do that is to my mind going to be a very crucial thing going forward avm khot Uh, you mentioned dualist technologies, and in space, other than an extremely small number of technologies, everything is dual use. And with minor tweaks and minor modifications, uh, the same technology can be equally profitably used both in the civilian and the military domains. If there was to be a single technology to be named, and that's a difficult one because there are just so many of them which are coming together. Uh, i would have to say uh, it would be artificial intelligence and applications thereof because the areas in which ai and ml technologies can be utilized are limitless because everything today is a cyber entity okay? and there is computers and there is processing involved in each of them and therefore it is possible to embed some level of intelligence in each of them what this does to the processes if you look at how space is run today there is a huge amount of man in the loop process involved in the command and control of satellites in the manufacturing in the designing in the ability to address you know emergencies and contingencies and things like that if you had more and more intelligence built into the systems spacecraft ground uh, you know and including the analysis and the processing part you would be able to reduce the human resource required to do this and the ability to make decisions based on what we have is going to go up extremely high what this means is you have autonomous satellites possibilities autonomous navigation on satellites autonomous command control autonomous station keeping you know so all of these things have the possibility of truly revolutionizing how we do things the same thing happens at the applications end if you embed an adequate amount of machine learning and ai technologies within your downstream applications your ability to analyze vast amounts of data it comes down to very very small if you had you know quantum computing uh, you know to this imagine you know to what extent the power goes your ability to analyze masses of gis data and to draw inferences out of them actionable intelligence and act is truly going to revolutionize how you do work thank you rohan what about you what has arrived what is yet to arrive hello yeah so my answer is digital map twin why i say this is because if you, everything has a location dimension on earth but also in space and even like micro level inside our body inside our mind and digital twinning that by modeling and mapping that that world digital twinning that and then applying algorithms ai etc can help us kind of simulate as well as 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 act so i really have this philosophical answer that's really the let's say long long term mission of map my india or maples to digitally map twin the real world so that then we can not just understand it model it but also then act upon it simulate it in different scenarios to get the best outcome that we're looking to achieve that's my answer yeah uh, from my point of view navigation technology it's already arrived it, when utilization starts yeah. it's going to change the way people are going to compute also today everyone is bothered about uh, where the So for example parents are bothered about where the children are there colleagues are bothered about where other people are there the companies are bothered about where their resources are deployed so navigation technology more so that multi gnss technology miniaturized into small handle devices 
will revolutionize the way we are computing. I, I think Giri, you have asked me uh, asked a fascinating question, and my answer is a little different. The the fact is not it's not about the technology. Uh, I come from Kerala, and we have a martial arts called Kaladi Paitu. Many of us were fortunate to learn that, and the most potent weapon we had at close combat was a small broomstick, it's only so small, and at best a pencil. It was not a knife, it was not a sword, close combat. Similarly, when you look at today's technology, uh, multiple, it's about how do you fuse it. So in battle, you have now something called teaming of armies, which is what is a very popular uh, strategy that is being uh, uh, preferred, going beyond interoperability. I would say even better would be teaming of technologies. How do you team these technologies? You play AI on quantum and quantum on, on HAPS and HAPS to make sure you get force multipliers. And whoever can do this and whoever can understand this will have the maximum kinetics with them. It's not going to be who has singular uh, technologies. You can have any number of technology, but if you can't Combine and use them. The effectivity that you have in a comparative uh, 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 scope will be much less. Thank you. Thank you. So with this, we come to the end of uh, knowledge session one. Uh, fascinating session. Uh, I perhaps I asked a question uh, that was too simple, but the answers that I got out of it was quite profound. And uh, Emerging technologies are something that we'll always continue to work upon, be it in 21st century or be it in 22nd century. So uh, we'll have to be on our toes. We'll have to keep innovating. There'll have to be a steady uh, collaboration between end users as well as innovators and facilitators like us who bring uh, such great people on the platform. So with this, we uh, come to the end of uh, knowledge session one. And I hand over to Nilanjana once again. Thank you. Please give them a big round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much for that session. May I please request Air Marshal Ajit Bhosle to please come up and present mementos to the moderator and the panelists. <clears throat> to the moderator, Dr. Chaitanya Giri. Editor of Interstellar.news. A memento to Mr. Toby Simon, Synergia Foundation. To Mr. V.S. Valen, the founder of Elena Geosystems. To Mr. Rohan Verma, the CEO of Map My India. To Mr. J.D. Patil, Lassen and Tubro. One more, one more. And to Air Vice Marshal D.B. Court, the former chief of the Defense Space Agency. Thank you very much. I request the moderator and our panelists to please uh, join. Uh, the rest of the audience while we quickly move into the second uh, inaugural session. But before that, ladies and gentlemen, a reminder, if you're posting on your social media accounts, please remember to use the hashtags uh, at the hashtag IDC 2023 and hashtag Catalyst 2023. Please